right now there are 900 Bitcoin naturally produced every day available for sale and the miners generally have to sell them. They have high electricity bills and high debt bills and build outs. Around April 20th, that'll be cut in half. That's 23 million a day or 20 something million a day. That's like taking $8 billion a year of supply out of the market. It will be the most consequential halving in the history of Bitcoin in my opinion. <clears throat> um, it will create a squeeze. It means at that point, if the, if the natural organic demand is in excess of you know, 25 million a, a day, then there is no natural seller. Um, so it's, it's obviously, it's very bullish for the asset class and for Bitcoin holders. I think that by 2028, you'll be down to 225 Bitcoin a day. It'll start to become second order. And by 2032, it's a rounding error in who, the who noise. The I think that there's a number of classes of sellers. The bankruptcy estates like FTX bankruptcy, Genesis bankruptcy, a lot of these people have billion dollar positions of, of Bitcoin and other crypto assets and they're not long term investors. They're just looking to unwind and get their creditors whole or unwind the trust. So they're the big natural sellers right now. So they were flushed out of the system? And they're getting flushed out of the system. And then I think the, the miners are, are the persistent natural sellers. Um, otherwise, the volatility in the system, it comes, um, there, there's a, the primary volatility is that Bitcoin is cross collateralized and cross traded with the other crypto assets. With, it, it's, tr it's an unregulated market traded offshore 24 7, 365. There are many, many billions of dollars of Bitcoin held offshore. There's $400 billion of ETH in a market cap. There's 80 billion and 80 billion of Solana and BNB right now. If you had a billion dollars of crypto tokens offshore, you could post it as collateral and you could do a $10 billion trade in an hour on Saturday night, unregulated, unreported. So the, the wild west, the number one source of volatility in my opinion is unregulated offshore after hours crypto trading. Uh, the second, the, the lesser source of volatility is the options and the futures and derivatives market onshore during normal trading hours in the Western world. But I think that, that although they are, are capable of face ripping trades, you know, the degenerates in the crypto ecosystem put them all to shame in terms of what people will do. The April 2024 halving is going to be the most consequential halving in the history of Bitcoin. As organic demand surpasses natural supply, it will create a big squeeze and this will drive the price of Bitcoin exponential to new all-time highs. This is the latest bullish prediction coming from Michael Saylor. The Bitcoin halving is scheduled to happen on April 20th and Saylor has been claiming that this Bitcoin halving is the biggest halving in the history of Bitcoin. Why? Because if we look at the impact in dollar value, at the last Bitcoin halving, the Bitcoin price was at $7,000. However, at the 2024 Bitcoin halving, Bitcoin is sitting at roughly $70,000 per coin. So although in Bitcoin terms, the impact of the halving is less, in dollar terms, the Bitcoin halving is three times more impactful, which is massive. The Bitcoin halving is poised to cause a supply shock, right at the same time as we are seeing demand shock play out as institutional investors pile into the newly approved Bitcoin ETFs. If nothing else, the Bitcoin halving and following time period promises to be explosive. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Sailor reveals why Bitcoin will eat all other cryptocurrencies over the coming years. Also guys, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy staying up to date with finance content, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind. Now here's Michael Saylor with his latest outlook on Bitcoin. I stay in my lane generally and I say you should buy Bitcoin. Don't sell your Bitcoin. Bitcoin's good. I like Bitcoin. It's an ethical commodity. <laughs> um, everything else in the... What I'll say about everything else is is the rest of the digital asset ecosystem is all a bunch of good ideas with a lot of regulatory uncertainty and competitive uncertainty and technical uncertainty. So they're all interesting ideas. Digital currency is interesting, it's very controversial. Uh, digital tokens are interesting, they're very controversial. Digital securities are interesting, 
very controversial. Digital exchanges are interesting. They're very controversial. I have, I have no recommendations one way or the other. When I started searching around and I discovered Bitcoin, I thought, okay, well, this is crypto gold, but it's got none of the defects of gold. It's got, it's got all the attributes of a big tech monopoly. It's, it's, it's better money than any economist has ever conceptualized in the history of the world. So I thought, this is kind of perfect money. It, I can't see it being more perfect. So the question is, is it going to be banned? Is it going to be copied? Or is it going to be hacked? It, you know, you start as the denier. It's, a, it's not a good thing. And then you go to skeptic. Skeptic is it's too good to be true. So when I got to my skeptical phrase, I just, phase, I just asked, will it be banned? Will it be copied? Will it be hacked? And I stared at it, and the conclusion was, it's only if it's understood to be property, not currency, then no, it's not going to be banned in a country that gives you property rights, which means it's banned in Cuba, it's banned in North Korea. If the world becomes communist and they deprive you of the ability to own things, that's an existential risk. But that's not a problem in Russia or China or the US right now. So not banned. Will it be copied? It was copied 10,000 times. They all failed. This is, this is the winner of the 10,000 experiments. So not, so yeah, it, it worked. And now will it be hacked? And Satoshi's got 50, 60 billion dollars in a wallet out there, then that's the reward for hacking it. And no one's figured out how to get the money yet. So it hasn't been hacked. And I know, I know it's, it's able to store 60 billion without anybody hitting it. So what I think, is I think the way to understand Bitcoin is, <clears throat> is everything you learned in economics and about money in your entire life was pseudoscience, you know, and superstitious. And, and you can't blame the economists for being mired in pseudoscience and superstition because we never had, we never discovered perfect money. And so Bitcoin is the first time that we actually discovered a thermodynamically sound, mathematically sound economic protocol in the history of the world. So I think we will date things before Satoshi and after Satoshi. And I think that you can't think of it as a network you, or as a product. You have to look at it as a protocol the human race discovered, like base 10 math, massive protocol like the metric systems, the protocol, like English is a protocol. And, and so this is the first sound protocol, economic protocol in the history of the world. Now we finally realize why seashells and bales of tobacco and fiat currency and gold coins and silver coins and copper tokens and glass beads and the giant stone coin and the yap people. We, feel, <laughs> we understand why that stuff never worked. Now you know. If you really understand Bitcoin, it's because I've got an asset where the energy has a half-life of forever, and the half-life of energy in gold is 30 years, and the half-life of your money or your energy in the dollar is 10 years, <coughs> and the half-life of your energy in the bolivar is one year. And now once you understand that basic breakthrough, now the light bulb goes off. So I think all the smart money, all the... All the smart people in the world that don't trust the bank, don't trust the currency, want to keep their money, they're all discovering Bitcoin. It's like all the smart people decided to use math and use this language. And now what happens in the future? Well, stuff will advance, but you've, you're going to have a trillion, then a 10 trillion, then a 100 trillion dollar network. And if someone comes up with a new crypto algorithm and it's better, we're just going to fold it into this network. And if someone comes up with, uh, with another twist or tweak, we're going to fold it in the network. You're not going to, it's like saying, everybody uses English in the world of science and trade today, but, I, but English doesn't have a word for my widget. So I think we should all switch to Swahili because they've got the word. And my answer is, I think we're just going to put the word into English and we're going to stick with English. <laughs> so... Bitcoin is a protocol, it's going to go on a long, long, long time. And I think that as long as the world doesn't plunge into some Orwellian, no property rights situation, 
I think we're good. Cardano and Ethereum aren't stable coins. No, okay. they're, they're crypto tokens, you know, which are probably unregistered securities. And so Cardano has been designated as an unregistered security by the SEC explicitly in lawsuits. Ethereum is this massive gray zone. So uh, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is the only, the only thing in the world universally acknowledged by every rational, intelligent person is Bitcoin is a commodity. Everything else you're going to see people disagree on and fight over and litigate politically, and there's a war that will go on. And so what I think is there's 10,000 things that people are going to fight over. There's one thing that, it, that is institutional adoption. It's clear. So it's, it's like asking me which of the 10,000 mobile apps would I suggest I should invest in. My answer is None of them, because there's a 99% failure rate in startups. So I'm not going to recommend you invest in a company. Which of 10,000 buildings should you buy? I don't know. Which of 10,000 pieces of art should you buy? I don't know. I mean, that's your business, right? If you want to do that, you do that. The only thing that I'm here to say is Bitcoin is a digital commodity. If you want global money, then it has to be a commodity. It cannot be a security. Right? I'm not going to tell you to buy Apple stock. Apple stock will not be a store of value in China in 100 years, right? I mean, even Tim Cook would tell you that. So, so the world is very complicated when you get into securities and, and other types of investments. The idea of Bitcoin is what if we had a global money that was based on a crypto network that's decentralized and ethical. If the administration flips and they allow companies to issue stable coins, then a company that issues a stable coin in a compliant regime will make a lot of money issuing it. And if the, if the next head of the SEC says that Tom Brady can issue Tom Brady coin and 10, 10, 10 million tokens and, and file a quarterly statement saying how many tokens are out there, then there's a business there. So there's a million, as I said, there's a lot of good ideas if you've got um, a regulatory regime that will allow you to do it in a legal fashion, then it might be a good business. So right it now, have to be zero sum. Okay. but bit, again, Bitcoin is. Uh, if you're trying to replace global money, if the question is which is the global money, Bitcoin's the global money. It's gonna it's gonna eat everything, right? If you want to talk about what's gonna eat, forget about cryptos. There's no money in crypto probably the total amount of money invested in all the cryptos since the beginning of time other than Bitcoin probably isn't even $50 billion. I, I, my company's invested $7 billion. There's not a single person that's publicly, and publicly uh, dis, uh, disclosed who invested $100 million in any other crypto project in the last decade I can think of. So I don't think there is any capital there. The capital is in gold, real estate, Art, corporations, the S&P index, and corporate bonds. And so what's really going to happen next is Bitcoin is demonetizing gold, silver. It's going to demonetize a lot of real estate. It's going to demonetize a whole lot of... Uh, S Why would you put your money in the S&P index when 493 of the companies are failing, right? So you talked about demonetization, right? The money, 500 trillion of it, is in the 20th century economy. It's not in the crypto economy. Mark. That's what's going to be attacked next. I think 2020 to 2024 was, you know, the, it was the, uh, I don't know, high volatility, high uncertainty. It's like that early stage of institutional adoption. But really, we start mainstream institutional adoption. I would date it to January 2024 with the approval of the ETFs, mm -hmm. the spot ETFs. <clears throat> And I think it runs, we, we have about a 10-year gold rush. It runs to 2034 November. Between 2024 and 2034, we will uh, have mined 99% of all the Bitcoin. So, so Bitcoin becomes, for all practical purposes, fixed by November of 2024. The last 1% comes out over 100 years. Okay, so we, we, uh, we have this 42-quarter period where at the beginning of the period... What percentage are we at now? Right now, we're Roughly. like uh, 94%. Wow. 
So we, you, you got, you, you've got, you, you think it's not much, but I mean, 5% is a lot <laughs> over 10 years up. compared to 1% <laughs> over 100 years. So there's actually still Bitcoin available for sale right now. The miners have to sell it. So at the beginning of this period in Q1, we're in Q1 now, if you go to January 1st, no institution could buy it even if they wanted to. It just wasn't on their radar. And um, so you really have 42 quarters of people learning what it is, studying it. It takes 10 hours to scratch the surface and it takes 100 hours before you get a degree of comfort. Most people, you know, once they get past the age of 40, they don't want to spend 100 hours learning a new thing. It's, it's very rare. So you've got Wall Street firms spinning up massive education apparatus. You've, you've got a whole set of stages of adoption. First, can I buy it? Then is it on the, the approved list for solicited sale? Then is it on the approved list for unsolicited sale? Is it marginable? Can I borrow against it? Is it optionable? Can I hedge it? Is it recommended? Is it structural? Is it built into a fund? That's like seven layers of adoption. People take a year to think about each of those layers. There's a, a, a hundred powerful entities that control huge amounts of money that will go through that in the Western world. So I think we're in this, this institutional education stage. And um, in 2034, it'll simply be the new thing. Right now, it's like, it's like the scary, exotic thing for most people. So there's Michael Saylor with his clear message about Bitcoin's potential. Saylor boldly believes the 2024 Bitcoin halving is going to be the most consequential and impactful Bitcoin halving of all time. By emphasizing Bitcoin's ability to preserve value and questioning the reliability of fiat currency, Saylor makes a compelling case for Bitcoin's future. With the Bitcoin halving poised to cause a supply shock, combined with the demand shock we are already seeing play out, the Bitcoin price looks like it can only go in one direction. Before we go, a quick reminder for those who are keen on staying updated in the fast-paced world of crypto and Bitcoin, consider subscribing to our daily 5-minute crypto newsletter. It's a concise resource for the latest expert predictions, breaking news, and top on-chain analysis trusted by over 60,000 subscribers for insightful crypto investment information. Click the first link in the description to join our community and elevate your crypto investment knowledge today. Anyway guys, hope you all enjoyed today's video and that provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one and as always, all the best.